This is the Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. It's a show full of informative chat and inspirational messages. The Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show on podcast. Hello, welcome to Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. I'm your host, Claire. It is Brain Tumor Awareness Month and we're shedding light on a crucial issue. Brain tumors claim more lives among children and adults under 40 than any other cancer. Shockingly, only 1% of the national spend on cancer research is allocated to this silent threat. Here on RTM Brain Tumors Talk Show, we're taking a stand. We're not just talking statistics. We're sharing stories, real heartfelt stories from people all around the globe who have been touched by a brain tumor. It's time to raise our voices and spread the word. By listening in, you're joining a movement to make a difference. So today, I'll be speaking to Jamie and let's give her a call. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for coming to share your experience and also just be a part of Brain Tumor Awareness Month. You're going to talk about your experience and how you are now. Yes, absolutely. Shall we go back to... 2005. Yeah. Yeah. So my brain has been giving me a run for my money since then. I have a very severe peanut allergy. In January of 2005, I had accidentally eaten a peanut butter cookie that just had a really small dose of peanut butter in it. Usually I can smell peanuts a mile away. I know if there's peanut butter in the food and I just don't touch it. So this cookie just was a homemade cookie and it just had a little bit of peanut butter in it. I ate the cookie and ended up having a anoxic brain injury because I coded twice. They ended up saying that I had a traumatic brain injury. This is my freshman year of college. So January of 2005, I went home. So I went to college in Missouri. After this happened, I came back home to Nebraska and stayed with my parents and did outpatient rehab for months to get back to a normal functioning level. And because I was so young when it happened, I was 19. The doctor said that my prognosis was really good, that I'll probably make a full recovery. Um, I did have to relearn how to walk and talk and do everything all over again. It's like I woke up from my medically induced coma and my first word was data. Like my brain was still there, which was good. Like memory wise, like I woke up and I tried to say that I was in college. So they just didn't know what I would wake up mentally being able to do. I went through in speech for months and then ended up going back to college. But so I started having routine scans for two years after that, just to monitor where my brain injury was. And the majority of the damage was in the back of my brain. So my sight was affected for a while, just had a higher prescription in classes, but everything all leveled out. I'm completely back to normal. The only side effect that I have from that brain injury is I have slight tremors Mm. in my hands and feet. So I don't have the pickup that normal people have. Like if there's a rock on the road or a stick or something catches my foot, I'm likely going to fall down. It's hard to explain, but they're not um, active tremors. They're reactive tremors. When something like hits my hands or feet, then it tremors a little bit and then I could fall or drop something. So that's the only thing that I had as a result of the traumatic brain injury that I had in 2005. I never heard someone refer to having that kind of a uh, fit you, got, you can't breathe that kind of thing but I didn't realize people yeah. then uh, yes think of it as a brain yes, injury that's, that's exactly what happened wow yeah because I ended up coding twice they had to revive me twice which is what cut off the oxygen to my brain which made me have the anoxic brain injury mm-hmm. yeah and so thank god it could have been way worse I'm, I was in the ICU for a really long time and they did say to my parents they didn't know what I was going to wake up as they didn't know how bad it was They saw the scans, but everybody was different and it was good that I was young. Thank goodness I was able to make pretty much a full recovery aside from the tremors. But that injury was in 2005 and I was going for routine scans until 2007. And then in 2007, they had just mentioned that everything looked good. I think I'm good to be discharged from like neural care. And I went back to college that next year, didn't miss a beat, went back to school, had a job full time, like just went back to being a kid. And then so fast forward to 2021, my husband and I had our third baby in September of 2021. And I was on bed rest with her for the month before I had her just due to high blood pressure and not feeling the best. And then after I had her, my tremors were so bad that it was hard for me to walk from one room to another in our house. It was hard for me to get to the car, to go to doctor's appointments. 
it was just very, it felt like how I felt when I first had my brain injury. My tremors were so bad. They hadn't been that bad in a really long time. So I had mentioned something to my OB and he just wanted me to follow up and go see a neurologist again and run some tests just to make sure everything was fine. He's it's probably not related because you were on bed rest so long. Your body takes a toll after childbirth. Remember when you had your two other kids, you were a tremor too. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I do remember that. So I did. I followed up with uh, neurology and they ran all the tests, the MRIs, EEGs, all of those things. Um, my tremors went back to what I know is normal a couple weeks later. So I just didn't worry about it. Um, and then I did get a call from the neurologist that said, you know this already, but you have a mass in your frontal lobe. And I said, what do you mean? I, I don't know that. And she said, there is, there's just a tiny little mass there, but I was able to pull up scans from 2007 and it's on there. So they told you about it. Like, I'm sure I'm like, oh, no, gosh. nobody mentioned anything to me. I had no idea it was yeah. there. I was being monitored for a brain injury in 2007. So no, no idea it was there. And she goes, oh, it might be an accidental finding. I wanted to refer you to neurosurgery to see what they think about it. But I think that you should just follow up with neurosurgery. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had my first appointment with neurosurgery. They basically told me we can wait and see if it grows. It could be nothing. It could be something. You have no, I had no side effects from it at all. Nothing. Wouldn't even know it was there. So I went for routine scans for almost two full years to see if it was growing at all if it had any tumor-like characteristics. And they did on my last scan in July of this last year, 2023, the doctor said it does look like it is reacting like an active tumor. I had to do a functional MRI and all of that stuff. So they gave me the choice to see if I wanted to have it biopsied or continue to watch and wait. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I just ultimately decided to do the biopsy. We have three young kids. I wanted to know what it was. So I did the biopsy surgery in July of last year, and it came back that it was a grade two astrocytoma. So super slow growing, obviously, because it had been there a very long time and probably could have been there a lot longer time without me knowing it was there. Yeah. yeah. After I got the diagnosis, I was super stressed. And you just, I've dealt with cancer with my family members and stuff, and you just never think that it's going to happen to you. But after I got the diagnosis, my husband and I stuck out. Second and third opinions, I was accepted as a patient down at the Mayo Clinic, and I had them read all my scans. I had scans done down there as well. I had a really good meeting with their oncologist down there, and she basically asked me why I was there. She said, this is this is a grade two. It's very treatable. Science is advancing every year. Like, why are you worried about it? And I just said, I just want to make sure I'm doing the best by my kids. Mm. So I had the option to do the removal surgery. and. My neurosurgeon here in Nebraska is one of the only ones that does uh, what they call a laser ablation. Mm. So they basically just take this huge laser and they put it in and they burn the tumor. That was the option that was presented to me for removal where they could get almost all of it and it wouldn't affect my function. If I wanted to do that, they would go ahead and schedule it. What was it like when you went in to have your surgery, like from the day you knew you had to go in? How did your day go? Yeah. So it's my husband and I had to be at the hospital at 6 a.m. And I'm an emotional person anyway. So as soon as we walked in, I started crying and I couldn't stop because I knew that I was going to have mm. major brain surgery. So you always think about what if I don't wake up or what if I just worried about my kids? I gave them all a kiss goodbye. And what if they don't see me again? All the things that you think of going into any surgery. But they had a really good pre-op in place. I did have to have a halo placed on my head, screwed into my skull in four different spots, which I think they use for some craniotomies as well. That was probably the worst part. So I got into the OR, they put the IV in and everything. And my husband, bless his heart, likes to tell jokes and make things light so that I don't sob and cry the entire time. Yeah, But their cyber pre-op knife. team is great. They, is that cyber, yeah, is cyber knife? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that just yeah. the worst so, word? Um, <laughs> just say, oh, you're off to have cyber <laughs> knife. And you're like, great. That really doesn't make me feel yes. very good. Yeah, that doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> yeah, could you call, um, could you call it a yeah, slightly so, different word? Yeah, really. <laughs> so that, the, I just had the halo plates on my head. I went down to CT. They did a CT scan and then 
drifted me off to sleep and they did everything else while I was asleep. Cut the small hole and did the laser and everything. And I was supposed to stay in the ICU for three nights. I ended up only staying in the ICU for one because I woke up completely the way that I went to sleep. Wow. And they discharged me the next day, which they told me that I would be in the hospital for five days. So that was a positive. So it was a very short stay and got to go home and do light duty for two weeks and not lift anything over 10 pounds. And, did it and feel then really I just surreal? went in for follow-up to take out stitches. Yeah, did it, yeah, really it, it does. Because they, they put you in and took you out is they didn't keep you there. Yeah. Did you think, yeah. what's just happened? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I was like, wait, they thought I was supposed to stay five days, but they just said like um, my post-op was doing so well and there was no reason for me to stay. Blood pressure was level. My MRIs looked great after I did two MRIs after the surgery. Just for them to get an approximate of how much of the tumor she was able to get. Mm -hmm. According to those follow-ups, I they said 80%. So there's still about 20% left in there somewhere. But I go in for my first post-op after surgery scan in a couple of days. So mm -hmm. just looking forward to seeing if there's anything regrown or what we do now. But surgery-wise, it was very smooth. Yeah. So really good, though. That's amazing yeah. that you did it so fast and you're in, you're out. <laughs> wow. Give me a chance, guys. <laughs> I wanted to lie here right. for a bit it was, and relax. Yeah, I yeah, would have loved a couple nights of un uninterrupted sleep. That yeah. would have been great. So. Did you have to yeah. stay awake? Uh, yes. That? You have to stay awake for the craniotomy. I was able to sleep for the laser ablation. Mm. So that's the only, the only kicker there. So there's not very many doctors that do this laser ablation surgery. There's a lot that goes into it. And I did end up having the laser ablation surgery in October. And before I went in for the surgery, they just prepared me for the worst. They said you could wake up, lose loss of speech, lose memory, like all of these things, which is a risk with any surgery. I went into the laser ablation and she was able to get about 80% of my tumor. So there's still just a tiny bit left, but so far we're smooth sailing. So yeah. hopefully that continues. Do you know um, what? It's good that you're, I know well, it's not good. None of it's going to be good, but that you're in 2023 because, or I suppose right. then is 2021 because they didn't have that available. Like I'm really quite far, like I'm 2008 was my diagnosis, but I'm like, I had to go straight in having knife or, or to have surgery and yeah. stuff. But I'm like, there's so much they're doing now that, did you feel like, gosh, I hear no one's do it, done this much yet or were you, and thinking this is really positive? Yeah, so it's super new. In the last eight years is when I came out. And like I mentioned, that my neurosurgeon here in, in Nebraska is one of the only ones that does it. Mm. So here locally, which ended up working out because this is where we are. But yeah, so there's a lot of risks that go into any surgery. And she did give me the option of doing the awake craniotomy and being awake for the whole surgery and having them take it out so that they could make sure my speech function wasn't yeah. being affected and all of that. I just figured if I could be asleep and she could get most of it with the mm. laser, I think we'll try that. And I just have a very a small scar on my forehead from it. So it's not nearly as invasive as a full craniotomy. So yeah, definitely. yeah the things that they come out every year medical wise is just yeah. great. What so this only happened not long ago, literally. Yeah, like, yeah, this last, last year. year. Yeah. So what would you say yeah. are the things that you've got that you didn't have before? Is there anything you've found that this is because of the treatments you've had? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was most worried about was my speech, but that's totally normal. I don't think anything function wise. I follow up with oncology later on this week and they're gonna do routine MRIs for the next in three to four month increments to see if it comes back. Mm -hmm. Um, and my oncologist did say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Mm. So that's a hard pill to swallow when know that something is going to come back or yeah. could come back. There are some new experimental drugs that are out that it's just like an oral chemo pretty much. So you would just take an oral pill every day that helps keep the tumor slow growing. So we'll follow up with the plan from there. I know it's still scary, but it sounds like right. it, you're doing pretty amazing zing stuff I know your confidence wise that's been really shook it's bound to be but have you yes found... of course yeah absolutely and I think that's almost the worst thing is to just your confidence have you found the support you need yeah I honestly when I'm stressed or anxious I prefer to be busy and 
like I mentioned, we have three small children. They're very active and are in sports. And my husband and my whole family has just been such an amazing support system for me. So I know that I could call any of them at any time and tell them I'm not feeling well or not doing well or need a minute or whatever it is. But the babies of mine keep me going too. There are some local places here in town that do operating tumor support. So I've gotten involved in their Facebook groups and um, the Head Start walks and stuff that they do. So looking forward to doing a little bit more of that because it is something that's not talked about mm -hmm. and people don't know about. And when I tell people that I have a cancerous brain tumor or had and they were like, what? What are you talking about? That's so crazy. You don't act like it. Yeah. And I guess I don't act like it, but still there. And it's yeah. still something I worry about. But I think just like trying to keep myself busy and being able to talk to other people that have gone through it as well is great. And it's such a great thing to do to read stories and listen to podcasts and hear about other people going through similar situations and know that, you know, everything is going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. There is so much support out there. I don't know yeah. if you get the exact support. Have you been able to have any kind of like counseling or something just so your mental state is you're coping? And Yep. So, yes. So I have. And they set up some genetic counseling for me, too. So I did some genetic blood work for myself just to make sure that this brain tumor wasn't something that could be hereditary that I could pass down to my three children. And I actually just got the results back from that. And my genetics are crystal clear. So there's nothing in there that would indicate that this tumor is something that I could pass down to any of them, which is a huge godsend. But yeah, I was talking to the genetic counselor and then just a regular family therapist too. It's it's good to get those feelings out and have somebody else listen to it and get new ideas and, and new ways to cope for sure. Yeah. What did you explain to your children? Obviously, they're so young. Did they yes. ask anything like, where's mommy or not on the day? But yeah. have you even tried to explain anything or have you thought this, they don't need to know anything right now? Yeah, so we, my husband and I really struggled with that. I didn't want my kids to worry about me. You never want them to worry that something's going to happen to you, obviously. But my oldest is 10 and he's very smart and has dealt with cancer-related stuff before with other family members. And my mom has survived breast cancer twice. She's the true warrior. So he's seen his Nana go through that. So I did think that I needed to tell him that this brain tumor that I have, it is cancerous, but I'm in the best medical hands. So we're going to take care of it and I have to have surgery. So I was very upfront with my kids. They knew that I was going in to have the surgery in October when I was going in to, to get the tumor removed. They knew why I was going in and what it was. And wanted to be very honest with them and let them know that this is serious, but I'm in the best medical hands. So just need you to trust that I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And my oldest was like pretty upset. He cried and was, I don't want you to die. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't want to either. But I always remind him of the family that he knows that has been through cancer related that are still around and are great and are his favorite people. So we shouldn't worry about that. But they all did very well after surgery when they got to see me. We're very supportive when I got home and they ask all the time now if I have to go back to the hospital, mm -hmm. which I'm like, no, not yet. Like we're fine. But I did initially prepare them too for me going through chemo and radiation because I didn't know what my plan of treatment would look like after surgery. I didn't know if I would have to do all of that. So I did prepare them for that. And right now I don't have to, but maybe someday I will. So I just thought it was best to be upfront with them and let them know what I was going through, but also not give them all the details. Yeah. <laughs> what was it like for you and also for your mom? So your mom's gone through it twice, having cancer, which must give you some confidence yeah. and things. But what was that like having to tell your mom that? Because that must have been, like, how did you, how she must have been like in shock. Yes, uh, she was uh, shocked is a great word. Yeah, my mom has been with me, um, sorry, to go to all of these appointments. And, yeah, uh, but we are um, amazing. So. Yeah, but have you been able to relate to each other? Because you don't always, it's not always yeah. easy to relate yeah. with your mom and your dad and your husbands and your wives. It's, she must literally yeah. have been like, did she come to you and say, this is what you're going to try. This is what works. This is what is going to work. Here's <laughs> yes, what you need. I mean, you know, and, 
when she um, got diagnosed with cancer for the second time, I had just found out that we were having our third baby and our only girl. We have two boys and a girl, and she was very excited for that. But she did. She had to go through all the treatments again. She ended up losing her hair again, had to do reconstructive surgery. Uh, and during that time, it was like right around COVID. So I would take her to appointments and sit in the car and wait for her to come out. And watching her go through that was, was hard, hard, but also she knows. So she's been my rock, yeah. my rock through this whole thing. So You must have sat there um, looking at each other was... and thinking, what? the heck did we do wrong <laughs> yeah it must be like what the heck? what did we do yeah that's especially really after unlucky. my brain injury in college too she was like i think like we, we've gone through enough i think this needs to be like we're done now yeah this so is enough we're yeah we're gonna get you through this yeah. and yes yeah, so hope to yeah that that is the case but it's She's been great. It's great to share that experience with her. She's very knowledgeable and it's been great to have her to ask questions to and stuff like that. Brain cancer and breast cancer are very different, but yeah. it's still cancer. So she knows the questions to ask and yeah, it's been great. So I lost my mom two years ago, nearly two years ago, and she went from cancer. And, and obviously I was sick. Like I say, mine was eight, but we were like, are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> I was like, what is this trial? Yeah, so your mom, yeah. your daughter. It you're like, question it, do you? Oh, yeah. You have, <laughs> oh, well, you do, don't you? You're like, oh, come on. Have you found something that's given you strength other than your family? Did you look into anything to find some strength? I really enjoy reading other people's stories and listening to other people's stories just to see what other people are doing and how they're dealing with things. And I try my very... <laughs> hardest to stay off of Google. It was really hard in the beginning because they when you Google you the things stuff. like, yeah, yes, it says you'll live for five years or mm -hmm. so I try really hard to stay off of Google, but and just like finding strength in like other people that I know that are going through the same thing. There's other people here in Nebraska that are going through the same thing. So it's good to connect with them and find out what works for them and what's keeping them going. What things did you find really helpful? that your mom suggested resting making sure that I yes I'm a mom I have three young kids but I also need to take care of myself they need me to be around so I need to take the time to take a nap and have her help with the laundry have my husband help run the kids around whatever it is like there's people around us that just rallied us with the support and wanted to help and staying hydrated and making sure if I'm not feeling well to ask somebody to help I think that's the hardest thing is when you're super independent and you're used to doing everything by yourself and you don't want to ask. not be able to do that for a while. Yeah. Yes. You don't want to ask. You don't want to burden other people. Mm -hmm. But just like having everybody say, you need to let us know. Mm -hmm. My work was super supportive and bought over meals for us and really like rally behind us. My friendship group um, was great as well. It's just having people to to support you through hard times and but also taking care of yourself staying hydrated and taking naps because you need them <laughs> did you find it, what was the weirdest or something that makes you laugh or cringe when you were going through treatment yeah so something that made me laugh one of the days I was explaining to my kids that the doctor was going to go in and disseminate the tumor with a laser and it's like new technology and it's great and all this stuff and my middle child looked at me and he goes, a laser? And I said, yeah. And he goes, like the lasers from Star Wars? I knew like he was going to say that. <laughs> She's a lightsaber to your head. Oh, God. And I said, yeah, honey, I think so. <laughs> and then when I came home with the stitches, I remember him saying, like, how was the lightsaber? Are you oh. okay? I'm, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> so that was like really sweet. Just like a child's perspective is yeah. adorable. But oh, um, yeah, I'll never forget him saying that. It was so sweet. <laughs> Oh. Laughter gets you through with some of the darkest times for yeah. sure. So I think of what what made me laugh after, and it wouldn't have been at the time because I would, I think I was pretty miserable when I was in hospital. I was there for I don't know. I think it was seventeen days, and I was pretty fed up and wanted yeah. to go home. But there was a time yeah. where you know when you're in the hospital beds and they have you've got your if you're going to the toilet you've got like a button to or you hover your they actually yeah. do the hover then but you press the button to flush the loop. call button. Yes, and then you've got the yeah. call button for the nurse. I just remember calling the nurse button instead of using the flush. 
And I was, so I came out and I heard this knock and I was like, oh, who's, I'm trying to get out the door. It was like the first time I'd got out of bed on my own and got to the bathroom. I come out and they're holding, they've got like a wheelchair in front of them. They're going, is everything okay? And I was like, yeah, I just was going to the toilet. And they were like, oh, you pressed the button. I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it was, there were so many of them. False alarm. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's nice to remember the little stuff that may have been amusing Yes, because <laughs> we need something <laughs> is there anything else you would suggest or something something someone said to you and you were like oh this was really helpful and that you could tell someone else? I, uh, I just would always encourage everybody to get those second and third opinions get other doctors eyes on your scans and get other people's opinions on their treatment and seek Medi like different medical professions opinions because everybody that I saw throughout the six months last year told me something different so it's it's good to hear I'll never forget I got a second opinion on on oncology and I said I'm just worried because they said that they could project how long I'm gonna live and I said I just want to be able to like I don't want to prepare myself for that but also I do want to prepare myself for that so maybe I should know how long I'm going to live. And he just looked at me and he said, you're going to be able to watch your kids grow up. And I just oh. bawled. I was like, I didn't even think about that. It was always You've got in five the immediate years. future. Yeah. Like, yes. If I think to myself, oh my gosh, like it, it could be that, which you don't think about that stuff until you get a diagnosis of, of something that could be life limiting. They you know? don't normally say that. They yeah. normally are told not to say things. Yes. And they don't give you much hope because they can't really promise you stuff and I just said I I need to know like yeah. what and he just held my hand and said you're gonna be able to see your kids grow up Aww. and I was like are you sure <laughs> yeah but it's just it's good to get those to get those opinions and mm -hmm. medical stuff is advancing every single year just always staying up with the new things and the new treatments and don't ever feel like you're stuck in a, a certain way with your treatment because there's well, lots of different options so mm -hmm. Would you have ever changed what you had? Would you ever say, oh, I wish we didn't do it that way? Yeah, I do think to myself a lot about doing the laser ablation. I was advised by a doctor to not do it because they want the tissue to study, to treat it, to treat the tumor exactly how it needed to be treated. I remember a doctor saying to me, I would never do a laser ablation because you lose all that tissue. So I would do an open craniotomy. So I do think to myself a lot about if I were to not do the laser ablation and I would have done an open craniotomy, but that it's hard for me to think about now because I don't know how that's going to affect me in the future. But for me, the laser was much less invasive and much less time that I had to be off work and didn't have to be away from my kids. So that just seemed like the best option for me. But I'm sure down the road, I might think about if and when it comes back, doing the open craniotomy and seeing what happens there. But mm. that's what's just so stressful about brain tumors in general. So oh, yeah, it's yeah. good to, yeah, not knowing. But right now, I think I'm glad that I went through with the treatment plan mm -hmm. that I did. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be on your podcast and I appreciate the work that you're doing Thank and you. hope that my story brings somebody um, I think it would have inspiration. Appreciate this. Thank you too. This is the Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show. Whee! It's a show full of informative chat and inspirational messages. The Auntie M Brain Tumors Talk Show on podcast.